good afternoon or good morning. I'm not sure where we are either. Dr. Uma Vengal Shivakumar is a filmmaker, critic, freelance journalist, media scholar, and film teacher based in Chennai, India. She has been a teacher of media communication for nearly 20 years. I find that hard to believe, but <laughs> she looks so young. And is currently a visiting professor of film in the Department of Dance, Drama, and Film at Kenyon College. She is a Fulbright teaching fellow at Kenya, Kenyon, where she teaches popular Indian cinema, directing for camera, and women in film. She is a professor in the Direction Department and is head of the Media and Entertainment Department of LV Prasad Film and TV Academy. She is the curator and artistic director of the first Behind the Lines, Between the Lines International Film Festival, celebrating journalistic courage under fire. She was the co-curator of the fifth Samsung Women's International Film Fest Festival in Chennai, she has contributed a chapter to the book, Channeling Cultures, Television Studies in India, published in 2014, and is currently writing a book on women in film in South Asia. She has been with the LV Prasad Film and TV Academy since its inception and became a full-time faculty member in 2009 as the head of the MBA in Media and Entertainment, co-coordinating with Manipal University and later with the Hindustan University. She has many, many other accomplishments, but in the interest of time, we'll save those for later. We will close with the fact, which you already know, that among all of her other duties and involvements, Uma finds time to be a Rotarian. Welcome, Dr. Uma Bengal Shevakumar. Thank you, Lena, and thank you, Tricia and Scott, for responding to my um, mail. I just checked out all the clubs, and then I realized this is one of the oldest clubs in the U.S., and, I've, and I'm really privileged to be here this afternoon because they responded so promptly. The minute I sent a mail, both Scott and Tricia got in touch with me and invited me to join in today's meeting, and then the surprise that Tricia sprang on me that I could actually speak and address uh, the members here. Um, as you already know from some of the stuff that's been said about me, I am um, a filmmaker and a film teacher. And one of the things that attracts me to come back to the US every fall to teach about Indian cinema is because there's a lot of interest in Indian cinema, but there's also not much of knowledge about Indian cinema in the US because they just dismiss it as song and dance routine and uh, it's really not so. Um, so Indian cinema um, is the most prolific film industry in the world. We make close to 1,600 films a year every year. And I wouldn't say they all are successful, but that's a large number of films to be making. And um, we also do, do know that Hollywood is one of the biggest global film industries in the world. And so in a way, we, we are both very film-going nations and film-aware nations that produce films and understand the impact of films. Um, Hollywood makes about 400 to 500 films. I mean, they make about 600 films, but about 500 get released, I think, annually. And the truth is Indian cinema is much, much more than just Bollywood, which is the name that you will find everybody using to describe Indian cinema. Bollywood refers to just one third of Indian cinema, which is made out of Bombay. And so in a kind of aspirational way, they like to call themselves Bollywood, which is not really a term many of us in India like to use because there's a sense of almost um, a second class kind of status to say that we are aspiring to be like Hollywood when we are not, totally not at all, because uh, Bombay might have that aspiration, the rest of Indian cinema doesn't. Indian cinema is way beyond Bollywood, and the largest number of films are made in one language called Telugu, which is in the south of India, and we make close to 400 to 500 films a year in that particular language, closely followed by Tamil, which makes about 300 films, 
And so Bollywood makes just about 200, 250 films a year. And, but they like to call themselves the representatives of Indian cinema. And so that's been a bit of a problem for us. There are over 15 languages in which films are made in India. Roughly the highest budget for a Hollywood film was for Pirates of the Caribbean, Stranger of Tides, which is about 378.75 million US dollars. The average budget for an Indian film is 1.2 million US dollars. So our entire annual budget for filmmaking in India is the budget of one film in Hollywood. We bring out 1,600 films in that budget, in that one budget that you use to make Pirates of the Caribbean. So you can understand the kind of constraints Indian cinema works under, and yet we manage to have a thriving film industry. And I think that credit goes to the audience in India, because for Indian audiences, filmmaking is a social way of life. It is not just entertainment. Primarily, Hollywood ends up being entertainment, and so people use it as one of the things that they may do at the weekend to entertain themselves. But in India, cinema or filmmaking, film going has become a social ritual. So oftentimes, film scholars across the world have spoken about this particular aspect of Indian cinema that we call the darshanic grace, uh, gaze. It's almost like we look upon cinema as a temple that we worship at. And you will find some of, the f um, some of the stories that you might hear about Indian cinema kind of supports that view. But we are same in many, many ways. We all believe in spectacle. We both, Hollywood and Indian cinema, believes in entertainment. We believe in um, getting audiences to engage with the narrative that's unfolding on screen. The biggest difference, though, would be that Hollywood works within the genre principle. And so you have fixed genres, specific categories of films in which you make films, and enjoy and engage with those films. So audiences, when they go into the, uh, to the theater to watch the screen and watch the story that's unfolding on the screen, are quite often within a certain generic contract and an expectation where they know what are the emotional states that they're going to be in. So for instance, you say it's a comedy thriller, you know that there's going to be some laughs and some chills, but you don't really expect to have anything else in that film. So if it's a romantic tragedy, then you know that it's like Titanic, it's huge, it's romantic, it's drama, but it's also tragic, it's going to end tragically and so on and so forth. But in Indian cinema, we do not believe in restricting that emotional engagement to just two or three emotions. Hollywood uh, system of making films is quite often three emotions. You go through three emotions when you engage with a film in Hollywood, made in Hollywood. But in Indian cinema, we like to call it a multi-generic film. It's almost like Indian curry. I don't know how many of you have managed to taste Indian curry, but you do know that there are a lot of spices, a lot of things that we put into it, and the word masala is what we use to describe Indian film. We call them the masala films. It's like cooking. Indian cooking is very much like, okay, let me throw some turmeric here, let me put in some chili powder. That's gonna burn. Okay, let me put some coriander powder. Okay, that's also spicy. Let me put a little yogurt in it. Let me put some flavorsome um, bay leaf in it. So you find that Indians like a lot of flavors, a lot of spices in their food, and very much like that, even their films are like that. They have a bit of everything thrown in. So in every single Indian film, you will find audiences going through a minimum of nine emotional states. We call that the rasa scale. That is, all Indian films do not just emerge as one medium out of the blue because there was a technology that was available. Indian films, most South Asian films and Indian films, emerge from a certain performance continuum that we are used to, where we don't like to just rest in one emotion. We need respite 
from one emotion. So we move into another emotional state. Then we come back to another emotional state and so on. So there's a cycle that we go through. So these are the nine rasas or the nava rasas as we call them in India, which is also our approach to cooking. We need the Navarasas in our cooking, we need Navarasas in our life, we need Navarasas in our entertainment, and so, in a way, these are all the emotions that we go through. Um, we go through sorrow, a bit of pity, we go through laughter, so there's comic, there's also fear, there's anger, there's um, awe, wonder, there's disgust, a bit of horror, a bit of valor, courage. So you can see that we don't like to restrict our films to just one emotion or two emotions. So it's kind of cathartic. It's like going to the temple, worshiping at the deity's feet, gazing upon the deity's beauty, and yet having a bit of fear that if you do something wrong, you're gonna be punished. And so there's this sense of going through all these various emotions. And so it's almost like a psychological outlet. You don't keep anything bottled up. So the biggest contrast in the reception of films between uh, Hollywood films and uh, Indian films, when I walk into a place in the US to watch a film, everyone is so quiet. <laughs> they're watching intensely. They're watching what is happening on the screen. Nobody talks, nobody makes a noise. Everybody is listening and watching. If you step into a theater in India, you will be wondering what is going on here. <laughs> because people will be singing, they will be whistling, they will be repeating the dialogues, they would have seen the film earlier, they would have watched the songs earlier, they would have listened to the songs earlier, they will be singing along. Some of them will get up and dance around. And it's like a festival, it's like a celebration. Nobody likes to just sit and watch a film. So the first week when you go to watch a film, you're just soaking in the sounds and enjoying it. By the second week, you will get to know what the story is. By the third week, you will understand the nuanced dialogues because up until then, it's so noisy, you can't hear the dialogues. And so this is a very clever marketing, I guess, because then it means repeat views. Repeat viewing, you keep going back because you want to understand the whole film. And then you want to sometimes go and enjoy one emotion, so you stay up till that and then you walk out. There have been many kinds of ways of watching films in India that is very, very different from Hollywood. Um, so, but today there's a lot of interest in Indian cinema by um, Hollywood film studios because China is the biggest market, but India has the largest returns on the money that is put into filmmaking. So all the six biggies from Hollywood have a huge presence in India today. And in the past five years, they've been making films in Hollywood where they have an Indian character or an Indian location or an Indian story. And so it's very, very interesting for us to see that happening. So uh, for instance, in Mission Impossible, you had Tom Cruise in that uh, climax in India. In MI4, he was in India, in Bangalore. In, I mean, they, they filmed in Bangalore, but they called it Bombay. So uh, that was one. Then you had Life of Pi making that huge impact with a huge film about a boy from India who gets marooned and on an island on various, various locations and then comes to the US and then tells us his story. Then you also have uh, The Great Gatsby in which you had Mr. Amitabh Bachchan, one of the leading superstars of Indian cinema performing. You also had the Oscar-nominated Silver Linings playbook in which the psychiatrist was an Indian, but not because he was Indian and transplanted from India, but because he works, lives and works in the US. And so there's a lot of interesting um, collaboration that's happening. There are remakes, official remakes of Hollywood films being remade in India today. They've not been very successful though because Indian audiences are very clever. They've already seen Tom Cruise in the original. Why are they gonna accept an Indian actor doing the same thing? So there's a bit of a problem there in terms of the vision that the Hollywood studios have. But just to give you a glimpse, this is also diasporic filmmakers in South, from South Asia who've lived across the world who are making films with an Indian kind of approach, but with a global story that they are telling. So this is uh, the famous uh, retelling of The Pride and Prejudice by Gurinder Chadda, who's from the UK, but she's of Indian origin, but she's lived, in, uh, lived and made her films in South Africa and in, in the UK. 
And she makes this film where she also brings in the American component. The bridegroom is from California. And so this film is about a retelling of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice in contemporary UK. Comes the tale of a modern woman in a traditional family. They came from two different worlds. Look around you. We're in Hicksville, India. He's such a conceited, arrogant. Hello, Lolita. Would you like to dance? Yes. So, I believe we're coming to your house for dinner tomorrow night. <laughs> Stand straight, smile, and don't say anything too intelligent. You. She practices what she preaches. <laughs> He was unaccustomed to her customs. I just find the whole arranged marriage thing a little backwards. She was unimpressed with his success. I'm sure you think India's beneath you. Then why would I be thinking about buying this place? <laughs> you think this is India? Hey! But in a land <laughs> where marriage is arranged... Why is he coming here? Lalita is unspoken for. So you can see some of those universal things. Girls don't talk too intelligently, otherwise you won't get a bridegroom. Uh, but anyway, the next clip, um, uh, this is one of the more recent song sequences which will recall to mind music videos made by Michael Jackson and others. Anyway, just watching it, you realize that there's a lot of influence from Rihanna's music videos, from Michael Jackson, and so Indian song sequences have become um, like um, American music videos. And this guy has um, was the was the actor who played Tom Cruise's role in uh, Night and Day, which was remade in India as Bang Bang. How unimaginative, but anyway. So this guy is uh, one of the most popular younger heroes of Indian cinema and he dances like a dream. And he was invited to perform here um, at California, at Tampa, Florida, I think. They asked him to do the opening act at some award ceremony, international award ceremony or something of that sort. So you can see how much of the influence we share with um, music videos from the US. So this was a film that kind of married two things in India that are a religion. One is cricket and the other is, of course, cinema. And he married these two and created this interesting period film, which was nominated for the Oscars, um, where he's got a motley Indian village team winning a cricket match against the occupying British. And so in a way, it was kind of nationalism, it was uh, cricket and cinema all rolled into one and it was a huge success. I think it'll, we'll move to the next clip. It's a lot of... So this group of um, mixed Indian uh, TV um, team, cricket team, which is made up of all the castes of India in a metaphoric way to talk about the entire nation rising up against British colonialism, which is something that we share with the, with the, the Americans. So in a way, Indian cinema is like um, religion, it's like entertainment, it's also our modern mythopia. It creates all the modern myths for Indian, Indian people to look at and say, okay, this is what I am all about. So it's a, it's a lot like watching Independence Day in the US where you kind of reaffirm your American nationhood. So in a way, cinema becomes Indian nationhood in, in a modern setting, in a contemporary setting. All the, all the recent films are like that. So they use metaphors, they use spectacle. So the last film, uh, yeah, this one, is a film that is making waves across the world. It has featured in BBC's 100 Greatest Films. It was just released about three months ago. Just before I left India, I watched this film. I watched it thrice before I could get the whole story. It's one of the biggest films made in India today. It's one of the most expensive films, but it has also garnered the maximum revenue ever for an Indian film.
सो ऑलमोस्ट ऑल द नाइन इमोशंस आर प्रेजेंटेड इन दैट ट्रेलर और हॉर फियर करेज वैल एंड देव टेकन अ लेसन फ्रॉम हॉलीवुड एंड डिसाइडेड टू मेक सीक्वल सो दिस इज द बिगिनिंग so they decided okay we have to blend marketing strategies from hollywood technology from across the world i think several technicians from across the world worked on that film just like avatar the word avatar itself by the way is taken from hindu concept of reincarnation and so it's very interesting that we just had a film called the shavataram and then avatar got released and we were like oh that's interesting and almost the entire story of avatar is what we've been fighting for in india there are six states in india that have been fighting a mining corporation and as those uh, as pandora unfolded we were like okay that is madhya pradesh in india so the we are increasingly seeing that stories are colliding technology is coalescing into you know multiple convergent technologies that we are all using today indian films are mixed for sound in california california hollywood films are partitioned and outsourced into india i work in a film academy which is inside a studio whose largest revenue is from restoring all hollywood blockbusters that were made on 35 mm and super 35 mm which are now kind of decomposing and the restoration of this and digital archiving of all the hollywood films are being done in my studio so my students get to work on these films if they are the ones who are working on animation and restoration so they go into those films interestingly though we don't watch animation films in india but we love to work on animation films so there's a lot of collaboration going on right now and i don't see a day too far off already in indian films we have argentinian camera persons californian sound engineers um you know stunt coordinators from hong kong so i don't see a day far off before hollywood makes a film that has technicians from india and indian films have hollywood directors maybe we'll see a steven spielberg's take on indian epics never know thank you for this opportunity any questions comments yes I am actually a, a rather big fan of Indian cinema. I actually watched Bang Bang about 2 weeks ago. Bang Bang is the scene Night Bang Bang is on Netflix and it's much better than Night Bang. Um, it has songs and dances. Well, as that actor is so good looking. Oh yes, Hrithik Roshan is to die for. Yes. <laughs> so my question to you is I have I have a family friend that brought me into Indian cinema years ago. I've been a fan of Indian cinema and I'm happy to see it coming to the US. It's a very conservative type of filmmaking. Um and with the clash of Hollywood and and you know forget the term Bollywood, how do Indian filmmakers how are they responding to a much more romantically open Hollywood versus very romantically conservative <clears throat> in India? Um again that's another stereotype and myth that is propagated that India is very conservative. the censorship laws that we have for indian films are a carry over from the british era and so that was a victorian sensibility that was imposed on india after all we are the country that has a entire temples that have erotic sculptures out in the open <laughs> so we are really not that conservative we've had kisses in indian films since its inception in 1913 india has had uh, a century of filmmaking and we have um it's just that i think we prefer not to show everything and so we kind of work on anticipation and teasing and so there's a lot of love play but there is no love making on screen so in a sense we're not really conservative i think just our approaches and aesthetics are very different um of late the sense of border in india has begun to think it's um more liberal but you would be interested to know that the james bond film that just released specter the censor board in india said that's too long the kiss so can you chop off 20 seconds of the kiss <laughs> and we were like how does that make a difference we have one film jodha akbar in which the the lead couple again hrithik roshan and aishwarya rai 
where they do an extended foreplay of six minutes, each you know, outfit being removed, the, the jewelry being removed, they're kissing, and all that is happening. They're making out for six minutes on screen. So I, I don't really believe that we are a conservative society in that sense. I think we just have different aesthetics of that. I mean, we believe certain things are for closed door, behind closed doors, and certain things can be out. And so there's a lot of um, titillation and teasing that happens, but not actual lovemaking. So uh, I, if Hollywood studios um, want to make films that are successful in India, they will have to find that, you know, find their way around that. But I also believe that Hollywood is slowly moving toward three-hour films. If you notice, beginning with American Hustle, they started going in for three-hour long films because they suddenly realized that their biggest market is not the home box office, it's not the domestic box office. They want to screen films in India, and our theaters are geared for three-hour long films. And so I think it will be more of a marketing maneuvering that they will be doing rather than content itself. And in a way, I think even in content, if you see James Bond cried in Skyfall, which he'd never done before, I think that's a kind of um, integration of different kinds of storytelling that's happening today. I don't know if it really answers your question, but I can tell you my young daughter of 17 years tells me that Hrithik Roshan is the only actor who's cool and hot <laughs> yes. Yes, I've been watching Indian Summers on Sunday night on PBS, and um, I basically like your observations about the accuracy or inaccuracy of what's being portrayed with respect to that period back in the 1932. Um, sorry, I, I don't get that. What, 1932 in? Have you been watching Indian Summers at all that's on public broadcasting? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's about India. It's a whole series. And okay. Um, are there documentaries made on India by PBS? No, it's a series. It's a, it's a series. I'm sorry, I haven't watched that, so I wouldn't know. But I do know that uh, films like Outsourced, films like MI5, they are still working with stereotypes. They have still not shown India the way it is. So for instance, in MI4, you find uh, there's a prince, and he's got a tray full of cell phones, and there are women in, I don't know, women with gold paint dancing at the reception. Things like that don't happen in India. <laughs> not now, not before, not during the royal princes. So there's a lot of confusion and stereotyping about India, and Slumdog Millionaire did very little to help the image of India in that sense, because it, it's a very, um, microscopic view of India, contemporary India. I mean, how can you imagine a film with one woman in India? Mm -hmm. Slumdog Millionaire, if you watch the film closely, there's just one woman character in the entire film. Mm -hmm. And that's really bizarre in a country that's grappling with population problems. We have more women and we, there's not a single woman. So the, the stereotypes have continued to persist in most American television. Big Bang Theory, the guy's name is Raj Kutrapali. And his parents are Punjabi, but his name is South Indian. And South Indian, again, very confusing. It's a Telugu name, it's a Malayali name. So I'm like, okay, where are you guys going with this? There's no intermarriages there. The parents are both Punjabis. How come these people, are, this guy's name is a Telugu name? <laughs> So yeah, we, we, are still uh, we are still grappling with that. Is the PowerPoint open? Oh, no, thank you. Uh, it's okay, not to worry about it. There was one clip I forgot to show, which is a film made by an Indian filmmaker made in, in, in the UK, set completely in the UK, in the US, called English Vinglish. I don't know how many of you saw that film. There's a wonderful scene about her attending English-speaking classes in the US because she feels incomplete because she doesn't know English. And it's a motley group of immigrants in the US trying to learn English, to fit into the US. I, I'm sorry, I forgot to show you that clipping. But that film, that scene tells you the kind of stereotyping that exists about the US in India. So I think it's, it's important for more cross-cultural exchanges to happen so that these stereotypes disappear. 
I particularly don't think that might be too accurate. Uh, I don't know, though I haven't seen it. I, I, I've come to expect that of US media, the stereotyping of India. So I'm really not sure. Yes, sir? Can you speak to the actor's difference between Hollywood and Indian film? You know, Tom Cruise will make multi-millions. What's the correlation between the number of films and the actor's uh, compensation? I doubt if any Hollywood actor would survive in India because they would have to learn to dance, they would have to learn to fight, they would have to learn to do a whole lot of things which they won't do in, in their films here. But in terms of payment, actors' remunerations are the highest part of the budget even in an Indian film. In that sense, they also make a lot of money comparatively. Relatively, for the budgets in India, they make very good money. But the studios have started, the Hollywood studios uh, have come in there and they are trying to pay these guys enormous amounts of money. I don't know how far that's going to be viable financially because Indian actors are like superheroes. They're expected to do everything. And uh, they get tired very quickly because their um, turnover rate is very high. So these guys act in hundreds of films. We make films in 15 days, in one month. Hollywood, Tom Cruise can work for four years making one film. But in those four years, that guy would have come, finished maybe 60 films and his career is done. So it's a kind of high burnout rate in India for actors because they work in so many films. Multiple films at times they are working on it. So it's a very different kind of setup. We, we make films in... The three films that I worked on, the fiction films, we finished filming in 17 days. And post-production in 40 days. And so in about two months, your film is ready and is released and gone. So that's a huge difference in the way we function. Yes, sir? Would you mind telling us a little about your club? Like how long they've accepted women and what projects that you work on? I think women have been part of clubs for a long, long, long time, uh, just like here. But um, our club is a little different in the sense we all belong to other Rotary clubs, but decided that, that, that there were some projects that women hold more dear than men. And so we found that some of our ideas when may not be accepted in other clubs. And so we gravitated towards each other. And we came from different Rotary clubs to form a new Rotary club, primarily made up of women. And we're just mentored by a couple of uh, the senior Rotarians from the other clubs. And uh, the kind of projects we take up are um, to work with women, health and hygiene. Uh, we work with children, mostly, um, which is quite usual for most Rotary clubs. But in our case, we work with the girl children in the schools more closely. So the menstrual hygiene, things like that. So we've adopted four schools. And uh, we we have implemented interact clubs in those schools and get these children to understand gender sensitivity because unfortunately for us, India tends to be a very misogynistic society and young boys are growing up with these socially constructed gender roles. And so that's one of our primary goals to, to bring in gender equal, equity, but literacy about gender equity across schools. So we put together a media literacy program and a gender literacy program that we implement in almost all the government-run schools, which is, which is usually attended by people from depressed communities. And so we try to reach out to them. We've adopted a tribal school. And um, we also, all of us, volunteer in teaching them. We've also adopted the Dyslexic Association of Madras, and we work with the children suffering from dyslexia. So most of our projects revolve around women and children. It's very inspiring. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very fascinating. Thank you very much. Next week, we're going to be hearing from the dispatch. We will have uh, Alan Miller and Stephen Zonars here. So be a Rotarian all week long. Yep.